Welcome back scholars to another video for chemistry. And this video is going to be about polar molecules and polar bonds. And so my objectives for you by the end of this video, you should be able to predict whether bonds are polar, nonpolar, or ionic using Pauling electronegativities. The second objective is that you should be able to predict whether these molecules will be polar themselves in other words, that means the molecules have dipoles, and you consider symmetry and the polarity of the bonds to do that. So what does it mean when we say that bonds are polar? Or what are, why do we care about this? Um, why do we care about the bonds if all we really care, care about in the long run are, is what the molecules do for intermolecular forces? Well, the polarity of bonds themselves are determined by electronegativity. And that polarity is useful for investigating molecules, especially in different places like out in space, on different planets, on different moons. Um, and polar bonds themselves are active for infrared light absorbance. So this is like heat or the light that we think of along with heat. And if you can absorb infrared light, then you can do infrared spectroscopy. This is extremely useful for investigating organic molecules, and the different types of functional groups that are in those molecules. And this is one of the ways that um, certain molecules like formaldehyde or alcohols have been discovered on different planets or different moons, like um, the gas giants or on some of the moons of Jupiter. Nonpolar bonds themselves don't absorb infrared light very well, but they do scatter what's called Raman light. Um, and this is useful in a technique called Raman spectroscopy, um, which you can learn more about in more advanced levels of analytical chemistry. The polarity of the molecules themselves is determined by the symmetry of the molecule and to some extent the polarity of the bonds. And if a molecule is polar, that means it has a dipole. And this is important because molecules with dipole absorb microwaves very well, and so you can do microwave spectroscopy here. And again, this is very useful in things like space exploration, but also at home in our own microwaves. One of the reasons why we have microwaves in our homes is because water has a dipole, and that microwave can put energy into the water molecules, and the energy in the water molecules then can be distributed to other neighboring molecules to allow us to heat up our food using a microwave. Um, the Raman spectroscopy with the nonpolar bonds in space exploration has also been used to discover molecules like methane, ethane, propane, molecules that do not have polar bonds themselves and would be hard to discover using other spectroscopy techniques. So if this polarity is determined by electronegativity, it would help to know what electronegativity is. And you may recall from earlier when we discussed periodic trends, that we discussed electronegativity, that we said the electronegativity was highest for fluorine. And with the Pauling electronegativity scale, that fluorine is, has a value of 4.0. And that's the highest electronegativity on the whole periodic table. And that's a measure of the relative ability of that atom to attract electrons in a bond to itself. One of the reasons why that electronegativity is so high for fluorine is because it's such a small atom relative to other atoms, and it has so many protons in its nucleus compared to other small atoms. Notice the electronegativity decreases as you go away from fluorine, and this is the values, or these are the values we wanna use when we're trying to determine whether the bonds themselves are polar. So what does it mean if a bond is polar? Well, if it's a polar covalent bond, the electron pair, the bonding pair of electrons, is not shared equally between the atoms, and this results in an uneven distribution of charge. And the bond polarity itself is a measure of the extent to which the bonding electrons are unequally shared due to differences in electronegativity of the bonded atoms. When you have these polar bonds, you develop partial negative and partial positive charges on the opposite ends of the bond. One of the things you should notice here with these symbols is that these symbols are the lowercase Greek letter delta, which is kind of like a curly D, 
our capital letter delta is a big triangle. When we see the big triangle, the capital delta, we should be thinking big change. When we see the lowercase delta, we should be thinking small change. We can also show the direction of the polarity of that bond, typically by drawing an arrow. And when we draw that arrow, the arrow is pointing towards the side that the electrons move in. That end of the arrow is more negative, and we put a little crosshatch plus sign on the end of that arrow that's more positive. And the size of this arrow, the degree of the polarity, depends on the differences in electronegativity. So for something, a bond that's less polar, we would sketch a smaller arrow for that. We determine these bond polarities by looking at the difference in electronegativity. So here now, see we have that capital letter delta back up again. So this means that we're finding the change or the difference in electronegativity between these atoms. And if we take two atoms that are the same, like the two chlorines on the right, then those are gonna have the same electronegativity value pretty much no matter what. And so if we go back to our table and we look at chlorine, when we look at chlorine, we see that chlorine has a value of 3.0 and that 3.0 for chlorine minus 3.0 gives us zero. And that makes sense because it's the same atom. And so this molecule falls on the pure covalent part of this spectrum between ionic, polar, and nonpolar. We go back again and we look at hydrogen and chlorine. We see that hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1, and we see that the chlorine, of course, is still 3.0. What's the difference between 2.1 and 3.0? 0.9. This difference makes this a polar bond. This is a polar covalent bond, has an uneven charge distribution. The chlorine notice is more on the warm end of the, this spectrum, and the chlorine would have a partially negative charge. The hydrogen is more on the positive end, and the hydrogen would have a partially positive charge. And if we were drawing the dipole for this, we would draw an arrow from the hydrogen to the chlorine, and we would make a little plus sign on the end of that arrow closest to the hydrogen. Notice that arrow points along the bond. I placed it above the bond, but it's actually pointing directly from the hydrogen to the chlorine. If we look at the sodium and the chlorine, and we come back to our electronegativity chart, the sodium here is 0 0.9, and the chlorine is still 3.0, which makes the difference between those 2.1. And this 2.1 is so large, this difference is so big, that notice the sodium here is all the way down pretty close to the 100% ionic, and the chlorine is all the way down also much closer to 100% ionic. Not only are these positive and negative, but this represents a full transfer of that electron, of that bonding pair. And even though you might draw a bond between these two atoms, this is really an ionic bond. These electrons really are not shared at all. Our arrow for our dipole here is gonna be huge because of that electronegativity difference. And so the way we can really tell the difference between these is that our zero to around um, 0 0.4 inclusive is considered to be nonpolar. And above 0 0.4 for our electronegativity difference to around 1.7, some people say 1.8. This is our polar range. 
and greater than 1.7, certainly greater than two, is going to give us an ionic bond where those electrons move completely from one side to the other and you create ions there that in what we might not have thought of previously as a molecule. So go ahead and take a look at the chart and hydrogen got cut off here. So I've given that value to you here. It's 2.1. And the rest of the chart is reproduced here for you to take a look at. And for each of these following pairs, go ahead and pause the video and identify which bond in each pair is more polar. And for that bond, sketch a vector, these are the arrows, showing in which direction the electrons are shifted. So for example, carbon is 2.5 and sulfur is 2.5. So what's the difference there for that bond? Hopefully you said zero. And carbon is still 2.5, but oxygen is 3.5. So what's the difference there for that bond? Hopefully you said 1.0. And in that bond, in that carbon and oxygen, which atom is pulling the electrons more? The oxygen is pulling the electrons more because it has a higher electronegativity. So we would draw an arrow from the carbon to the oxygen, putting a plus sign on the side where the carbon is to show which direction the electrons are shifted in. So what you should go ahead and do with these other four pairs is go ahead and pause the video and determine which bond is more polar. You may decide that both bonds in each pair are equally polar, in which case you would not sketch in a vector. Go ahead and pause the video if you have not already done so. Last chance to pause. All right, so in B, notice that the atoms are the same on each side of the bond in both molecules. So our Deltas are zero for both molecules, and there is no polar bond in either the chlorine or the oxygen molecule. In the NH, the difference between nitrogen and hydrogen is 0 0.9. For carbon and hydrogen, the difference there is 0 0.4. Remember, a difference of 0 0.4 is considered to be nonpolar. But the difference for the nitrogen and hydrogen, not only is that polar, but that's also high enough that it's higher than the carbon and hydrogen would have been, even if both were nonpolar. And the nitrogen is the higher atom, so our arrow for that points from the hydrogen to the nitrogen. With carbon and fluorine and carbon and chlorine, notice that the one atom, the carbon, is still the same. So really look at the fluorine and the chlorine and think about which one has the higher electronegativity and the fluorine is always the highest. And so the CF bond is more polar than the CCL bond. And our arrow points from carbon to fluorine. Finally for pH and NCL, Notice that even though all of those atoms are different, the differences in electronegativity between both of those atoms are again zero in both cases, so neither one of those is more polar than the other. Keep those pairs in mind. We'll come back to those at the end of the slides. Once you know whether the bonds are polar, then you need to think about the overall molecule. The overall molecule's shape will determine in which direction those bond polarities point in. So if you have a non-symmetrical distribution of electrons, then you have a molecular dipole. This is most often caused by polar bonds or a non-uniform distribution of polar bonds. So when we look at carbon dioxide though, and we know this is a linear molecule, and in this linear molecule, our two bonds, our two polar bonds, are pointing directly opposite from each other. 
What example can you think of where you might have two things on opposite sides pulling on the same object? A tug of war is always what comes to mind for me. And in this case, in this tug of war, neither oxygen is winning. Neither oxygen is beating the other oxygen with its tug of war. And so even though these two bonds are polar in the carbon dioxide, because they are 180 degrees apart and they are perfectly symmetrical, they cancel each other out. And so the molecule overall does not have a dipole. So again, for an overall molecule, we can look at the bond dipoles. We can treat those like arrows or vectors, and we can see how those arrows add up. When the bond dipoles create a separation of electric charge because they're pointing in the same direction, then you have a bond, then you have a molecular dipole. So the water, the OH bonds are polar. Those two arrows on the OH bonds are both pointing towards the oxygen. And because water is a tetrahedral molecule, because we would predict this bond angle would be 109.5 degrees. It's actually a little bit smaller because of the lone pairs, but we would predict 109.5. These dipoles, these bond dipoles are not going to cancel each other out. In the long run, they are both pointing up from the hydrogens to the oxygen. The side with the hydrogens becomes slightly positive and the side with the oxygen becomes slightly negative. This results in a polar molecule where the sum of the bond dipole vectors is greater than zero. So if you have polar bonds and you add up those arrows, you add up those vectors and they don't cancel every, all, each other out, then you have a polar molecule. We can measure this polarity of molecules by calculating or measuring something called a dipole moment. And this dipole moment is measured in a unit called a Debye. And the strength or the size of this dipole moment determines how strongly these molecules will line up when they are within an electric field. So on the left side here, the electric field is off. On the right side here, the electric field is on. And the positively charged hydrogens, and the negatively charged chlorines will point at the oppositely charged plate. Remember, these are not full charges, they are partial charges, but the strength of that partial charge, the strength of that dipole moment determines in which direction those molecules will line up. And the stronger the dipole moment or the higher the dipole moment, the more polar the molecule will be. So here's a few molecules as examples. And if we look at these molecules, we can see the hydrogen and the fluorine, 2.1 and 4.0. The electronegativity difference is 1.9, okay? This might be over the edge for considering it to be ionic. It is also uh, covalent for sure because HF exists as a gas. Um, the water molecule, which is next, the difference there, the difference is between 3.5 and 2.1, and our difference then is 1.4. Notice the difference for HF was pretty close to the dipole moment but the difference for water is not the same as the dipole moment. Part of this is because these bonds are pointing at different angles from each other. And part of this is because the dipole moment is not really connected with the difference in electronegativity. The NH3, remember the shape of that electron geometry for NH3 would be tetrahedral. The bonds here between these hydrogens would all be 109.5 degrees. They're again a little bit smaller 
not as much as in the water, but a little bit smaller because of that lone pair. However, because those NH bonds are all pointing down, like in a big tripod, that mean, means that all of those bonds are pointing up towards the nitrogen. All of those bond dipoles are pointing towards the nitrogen. So our bond dipole overall points up, and this is a, still a pretty polar molecule. One of the other things you can do is you can look at putting atoms all around. This is still tetrahedral, and tetrahedral would be very symmetrical, except the hydrogen here is not the same as the chlorines all around this molecule. Because that hydrogen is different, overall there ends up being a dipole that points down towards the chlorines, and this molecule is still polar, not as polar as the ammonia, definitely not as polar as the water or the HF, but this is still pretty polar. If we replace that hydrogen with a fluorine, now that fluorine pulls on the electrons, and that fluorine pulls electrons away from the chlorines, now we've got a four-way tug of war, and the fluorine is winning because this molecule is polar. It does have a dipole moment. The dipole moment of this molecule is one of the reasons why it used to be used as a refrigerant in uh, air conditioners and refrigerators until being phased out because it is a chlorofluorocarbon or a CFC, which can damage the ozone layer. So remember that electronegativity is the relative ability of an atom to attract electrons and a bond to itself. What did we see when we looked at the difference in electronegativity between phosphorus and hydrogen, or between nitrogen and chlorine? And the differences for both of those were zero. And so we can see dipoles for molecules in which the delta, or they have no polar bonds, but remember we said that the determining factor, one of the determining factors for these molecules is not just whether they have polar bonds, but also whether they are symmetrical. And if you look at the pH, notice that there are hydrogens down here, but the electrons in those bonds are tied up between the phosphorus and the hydrogen. Those bonds will pull those hydrogens in close to the phosphorus, but there's this lone pair up here and so when we look at the symmetry of the molecule, we see more electrons at the top of the molecule. We see this warmer color here at the top of the molecule on this electrostatic potential map, and we, we measure their dipole moments. pH3 has a dipole moment of 0 0.96, which is actually more polar than this um, trichlorofluoromethane which had a dipole moment of 0 0.45. So even though this does not have any polar bonds, it's still more polar because it has an uneven distribution of electrons. We see the same thing happening with the NCl3, but now remember these chlorines have their own lone pairs. Because these chlorines have their own lone pairs, the difference in electronegativity here or rather the uh, dipole moment of the molecule is not quite so large. These chlorines are also bigger and they push each other apart. And so even though we would say this would be a tetrahedral molecule, because the chlorines are so big around the nitrogen, the bond angles here might actually be a little bit greater than 109.5 degrees. So the big items to remember for this are that the polar bonds tend to cause, where was it? Polar bonds tend to cause a non-symmetrical distribution of electrons. A non-uniform distribution of polar bonds can cause this, but the molecular dipole itself results from a non-symmetrical distribution of electrons. And whether you have polar bonds or not, 
there are many cases where you can see non-symmetrical distributions of electrons leading to dipole moments for these molecules. Please uh, check into the chat, the discussion group, and stop into office hours or our chemistry session next Wednesday at 1, 1 p.m. for more information.